Mm-hmm. Okay. Hello, my name is Altea Aguel, and I'm a student at Long Beach Polytechnic High. This is my second year in FLA, and I am incredibly honored to be interviewing June Millington. June was part of the first all-female rock band to sign to a major label, and since then she's released her own solo music and opened the Institute for the Musical Arts with her partner activist Anne Hackler, and released her autobiography, Land of a Thousand Bridges, Island Girl in a Rock and Roll World. Thank you for being here Miss Millington. It's my pleasure. So how have you been first of all? I think uh, I've, I've been well. I'm 72 now and I'm, I feel like I'm still really active in life and also musically. I do a live stream every week uh, from IMA on my Facebook in which I do basically it's a musical life review for me. So um, I think of songs from when we first started our first band in high school, and maybe even from before that, when we were playing ukuleles in the Philippines. And it's really, it's really fantastic for me to relearn these songs, or sometimes learn them for the first time. And I feel like you know I already knew them, but I, sometimes I just don't discover I don't quite. So it's a wonderful, it's a beautiful challenge actually. And um, so I'm in, I'm enjoying life to tell you the truth. So I'm, I'm well. And the pandemic, has it impacted you in any way? Have you done anything involving music during then? Oh, yeah, I've, I've done uh, quite a number of things involving music, partly through IMA because, uh, you know, we are a nonprofit for women and girls in music. So, for example, about two weekends ago, we um, f uh, co-hosted along with two other groups. One is a school, one is a theater nearby to raise money. Uh, to keep doing shows and keep, to keep doing our programming. So for two days or two evenings, um, there were a whole lot of people who combined musically, including including us here, to present the show. Also, um, I do a lot of interviews. I'm doing an interview or a session tomorrow with kids um, up in Canada, in Ottawa, uh, whose teacher discovered me. You know, it's wonderful to be discovered because for the longest time, People didn't pay any attention to me or to us. You know, as the saying goes, you couldn't get arrested. So I'm enjoying this resurgence of, oh my God, how did I just find you? You're, you're this, you're that, you know? So that's kind of enjoyable for me to tell you the truth. Um, so it's all good. Um, the pandemic in terms of how it has impacted us, you know, in uh, purely like the programming way is like, for example, this summer we did our rock and roll girls camps virtually. Um, and that was a success. Um, we are doing right now, uh, I can hear in the other room, the other computer going and there is a recording program for adults. And by the way, our instructors are like, you know, the best in the world and I'm not kidding you. The best women, for example, best women engineers and so on. So um, it hasn't really stopped us. I did one live show at Mass Mocha. You probably never heard of it, but it's a huge institution, um, an art institute in Pittsburgh, uh, excuse me, Pittsfield, which is about an hour from here. So I did that, but I, I did it with my nephew Lee and um, Naya Kete, one of our very first graduates from rock camps. Uh, we were able to do it live because they they put us on a balcony and the audience was way down here. So they were looking up at us. And so for us, it was socially distanced and all the uh, spots where people could sit were marked with squares. So that was kind of interesting. Um, so it hasn't stopped me from doing music, both live and virtually, which is really great. I, I, I so much love doing music. It's what I do. It's my passion. That's great to hear. So you've mentioned not being seen before, especially in the music industry. I think that advocating is very important. How have you found yourself to be advocating for your skills, especially in a world where women aren't as accepted in rock music? Well, quite frankly, number one, I never shut up. I never stop. And that's like really important. I don't do it in a way that would be annoying to people. But for example, if you went to my Facebook page, you'd see story after story in which I give anecdotes on how I learned a song or what we did in Fanny or whatever. I feel like continuing to tell the story is really ad, uh, important. Now, as for advocating to myself, it, it sort of works itself in there. You know, I, 
Uh, not very many times in my life have I had a, a publicist, for example. I mean, that's not to say that I haven't, but, uh, you know, I think you just need to say it over and over again. And fortunately, and this is a point that's on my side, I'm really good. You know? So, uh, I, I may have put up, you know, most people don't even know that I have a life aside from Fanny, a musical life. I've never stopped. So Jean and I did Ladies on the Stage in 1978. That was when disco was happening. Then I did my first solo album, Heart Song, in 81. And then Anna and I formed I May. Um, and we recorded quite a number of albums there. And I've, you know, done an album since then here at I May called Play Like a Girl. That song is really important. So um, I, I should actually be advocating for Play Like a Girl a lot more because it's funny, people keep ordering that album, but I kind of feel like people don't talk about it. What they do talk about is ain't that, ain't that peculiar. That Beat Club series has hit the world like a, I don't know, like a storm, like a log falling on the ground right by them. Like, wake up, did you not know that there was this band? It just so happens that I sang that song. So I'm featured, you know, it, it's just by the luck of the draw that everyone has fallen in love, our version of, our, our Fanny's version of that. And that's by, partly because of my um, strong electric slide guitar part. Um, I'm sure you've heard it before. It's had over three million hits on the Beat Club. Maybe it's getting closer to four. So, um... And also there was something, a uh, Fanny podcast through fannyrocks.com. So a lot of people are, anyway, it's catching up with itself. Uh, the Fanny myth. But see, the thing is, you can actually see us and you can see how good we were. And I'm putting up other footage because I've, I've been shooting us in our daily life and our shows for about, I was at Jean's house in LA around 1986. And she handed me her video camera. She said, I'm, I'm going to make lunch. Would you just shoot a couple of shots of the kids? And I looked up. It was like seven years later. I got so uh, drawn in to every image, every flower, everything. So I started to shoot everything. And before that, I have lots of tapes of Fanny rehearsing at Fanny Hill. Uh, you know, outtakes in the studio and so on. Because I've always been... Well, a, a little backstory. My father's mother was actually uh, uh, an archivist and musicologist. She was a really good friend of uh, Pete Seeger's. In fact, if you look up Pete Seeger, June Millington, you'll find an, inter an interview I did with him and I put up on YouTube. But she was a real archivist and she, she collected songs and stories. In fact, all the songs from Pete's first album, Songs of Appalachia, he got from her. So oddly enough, I'm cons I'm um, not considering, I'm continuing her work. But see, I didn't know that. I only met her once in her in my life. In 19, uh, I think it was, um, well, I was on the road with Fanny, so maybe 72, and she died in 73. I only met her one time. But that, uh, I would have to say, almost like a genetic predisposition is very strong in me. I was meant to do that. So I've been archiving my life and everybody around me for like 30 years and maybe even 50 years because I recorded on cassette. Boy, when cassettes came out, that was, ah, oh, wow, that was such a big deal. So I have a lot of stuff to draw from, which is why I've asked if, if this interview could uh, be contributed to the IMA uh, Living Archive. It's a really important thing. We have to leave our history. We have to know who came before us, which is why I was so happy that you wrote to me and asked me uh, to do this interview. Just to add in, I love Play Like a Girl, that song, it makes me feel so motivated. Um, so to add on to like knowing your life purpose and from your, um, from your parents and grandparents, how did you know, like when was the moment you felt like you wanted to take music professionally and further outside of your home? You know, I, I don't think there was a moment. I think that music infused both me and Jean since we picked up ukuleles in, in the Philippines and Manila and started to learn songs from the radio. It wasn't like a choice. It was just like it, one minute it wasn't that the next minute we were, it everything fell on us, you know? 
Um, I do have to say, however, that starting around age five to age eight, my mom had me take piano lessons with uh, one of her brother's wives who had studied actually at Juilliard. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty big deal. She got on a ship and went to New York by herself after World War II and uh, graduated from Juilliard. So she was a very accomplished pianist. and But you know what? I wanted to play in the trees. And I did play in the trees. I was playing sonatas, you know, for the family uh, on Sundays uh, before or after dinner. You know how Filipinos are. I mean, you all get together, right? The whole thing, the family thing. So, um, but I, I guess I started to skip, <laughs> skip lessons. And I, my mom would find me out, you know, playing around the property. So... One day she said, well, that's it, you know, if you don't want to play piano, I'll, I'll stop the piano lessons. And I didn't say anything to her because I'm like, oh, yay, you know, now I don't have to take these lessons. But it was a couple of years after that, that somebody said, hey, uh, had as a ukulele, some family friend or cousin or something, and said, why don't you play this? Uh, this is how it's too. My dog has fleas. That's it. That was the only instruction we ever got. And boom, we were off. We started to do songs off the radio, which was incredible ear training for what I do now. Because, you know, everything is based kind of on one, six, four, five, I guess you'd say, or bum, 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 do, 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 do. They're all kind of the same. But every a variation of that in a hit song, we picked up on. So we were hearing this stuff. We were meant to do it, actually. And uh, we moved here when I was 13 and Jean was 12. And, um, you know, we, we just kept doing it off the radio. And I started to write songs right away because by then we had gotten a couple of acoustic guitars just before we got on the ship, actually. So once we got here, boy, now we were, saw, uh, you know, learning songs off the radio like Believe It or Not, Puff the Magic Dragon. That was a huge hit. So on and so forth. You know, we, we just kept going. Uh, uh, Be My Baby, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? I mean, Heat Wave, uh, Nowhere to Run. I mean, you know. So we learned all those songs. And then by the time we started a band, uh, maybe three years later, already the um, ground had been more or less developed. We were ready to be to start learning for how, for ourselves how to be in a band. And I and I'm, I, I don't want to overstate that because, first of all, there were no all-girl bands. You know, we could see the Supremes, but they were not playing their own instruments. So, but there was no one who was going to teach us. How, how do you, how do you be in a band? How do you play together? Oh, I, you know, so you learn a very quickly, we learned very quickly with the uh, other two or three girls whom we started the band with that the, our job was to get people on the dance floor. That was the job. And so we really learned how to do that. And uh, I still I still love everything that we did back there. You know, here we go, here we go again. Ooh, catch us if you can. You know, stuff like that. The Beatles, the Beach Boys. It was a terrific time to learn music and to somehow break through as girls. Because, I mean, you know, there were no, you, you really shouldn't be in an all gang. You wouldn't be in all gang, it was all girl band. It was kind of almost against an unwritten law. But thank God that Jean and I were already in love with music and, and we shared all the travails together, all the successes and all the setbacks and everything. So basically we just never stopped and that's the key. That is the key. Um, so you've talked about like when you were first starting out in Fanny, that you weren't supposed to be the lead guitarist. How did you teach yourself about how to be a lead guitarist? And well, how okay, so let me, let me just clarify that. It wasn't that I wasn't supposed to be the lead guitarist, is that I wasn't the lead guitarist. We had another girl in the band by the name of Addie. And she's still around, she's still playing, she makes guitars now, in fact. So, um, uh, basically, I, I shredded on rhythm guitar, which is, by the way, something I love to do. I love playing rhythm because you can express the song and how you play rhythm, and also you can express going from one section to the other. So whether or not I'm playing with drums or bass or whatever, I express that. It's it's in me now. Um, 
as to how did I learn how to play lead guitar, by that time we were in LA and, and Addie quit the band and Gene and Alice said to me, they turned around to me and said, well, now you have to play lead. And I'm like, what? You know, I was terrified, terrified for a couple of reasons. Number one, I didn't, I didn't really play lead guitar. How did you do that? Um, I never really took like a solo that challenged me, you know, that kind of thing. And also, uh, you know, yeah, how, how did you do that? It was a, it was a, and, and I was shy. Let's, don't forget that. Well, I haven't said that to you before, but I was terribly shy for quite a number of reasons. You know, when we were in the Philippines, we we're of course biracial, bicultural, um, and we were half white, but you know, that, that privilege only extended so far. Okay. So you get to Sacramento and we were, uh, I'm not white enough, you know, et cetera. So, and also I was very shy. I don't know if it was because of the, you know, the different prejudices that we faced. I was really wary of the world. I, and I still kind of feel like, gee, we just get dumped here. We don't have any instructions. You know, what do you, what do you do? It was the same with lead guitar. I don't have any instructions. I don't have any role models, you know? So what I did quite literally, I would pick songs that I wanted to learn that lead guitar part. And I would be with my 45 or my, you know, long playing. Sometimes I'd have an LP and I'd slow down the solo, so I'd have to learn in a different key, but that's okay. So I would learn solos that I was really interested in. Um, and I would take those on. Um, but you know, uh, a lot of lead guitar playing is your tone. So, uh, I happened to become really good friends with like Skunk Baxter and Lowell George and people that we met like at the Whiskey A Go Go or Skunk was my, uh, actually he was my um, uh, guitar repairman because Lowell said, hey, there's a new guy and he, he's really good, you know, so I didn't even know he played. Anyway, all these guys became my really good friends and together, see, what we call uh, classic rock that style of play didn't really exist. There was blues and there was funk. But what we call classic rock, no. Okay, so these guys were inventing it, right? And I happen to be friends with theirs. So, you know, if Lowell found a, a, a new amp that he really liked, he'd rush over to my place and let me know about it and we would play, you know. So we would, uh, let's put it this way. The guys were uh, divided for me personally. I don't know, to the world. The guys were divided into those who accepted me as their peer and those who wanted to put me down by showing me they could play more, better, faster, which is something I do not care about. I don't care about more, better, faster, actually. And I don't know if I knew that right away, but finally it dawned on me because I was just as interested in Eric Clapton as I was with Joe Pass, you know? Those are completely different styles of guitar playing. And finally, I realized, you know, I can't play like either one of those. Well, I'd have to say guys, because I didn't know any women who played really well till we met Bertha, by the way, the band Bertha in L.A. Their lead guitar, wow, she was so great. Anyway, so um, I stuck with the guys who looked at me at a certain way. There was a, uh, in a certain way, there was respect there, you know. And I knew that they weren't trying to play louder, better, faster, because there's no point in doing that in front of me. I'm not going to get that part. I'm not going to learn that. So they met me at my level, and I feel like um, I was just so lucky that when I had to learn lead guitar, I had friends who would help me on the way. Elliot Randall, the guy, the, the lead guitar player for Reeling in the Years, do you know that, that solo? Brilliant. <laughs> Are uh, you really in the years? That's an incredible solo. But I met him before he did that. I met him at the Whiskey A Go Go because Fanny did a gig with his band, Elliot Randall Band. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, how does he do that? Yeah, I was like, yeah, how does he? You know, and I become friends with him. And it's not like he taught me how to play that. It's just that he was willing to jam with me and I could watch what he was doing and kind of, if it, there was something that was. I really wanted to learn. I maybe we'd stop and I'd ask him, but I learned just as much from playing with 
Rainy Night in Georgia. You know, do you know that song? It's got incredible guitar parts. Oh, you should look that up. Uh, so that was a, a hit. Well, we were in L.A. by the time, so 69, 70. I learned by Brooke Benson, by the way, that version. I learned every lick. I learned every single guitar lick, and I still use them. So, I, you know, you could say that I formed my own college course. I really did. And I picked my teachers, or I found my teachers, and somehow we stumbled into each other. And so I feel I'm, I'm really lucky I had the dedication and, and I had the will. And by the way, I knew how to study because I grew up in Manila. Okay? Uh, Filipinos know how to study. There's a certain way. You know you have to apply yourself and you don't try to cut corners and shirk and so on, you know. One of the things I teach my students now is if you don't know something, don't try to rush through it because you're practicing a mistake. I'm just throwing that in there. Don't practice your mistakes. Slow down, figure out where the problem is and adjust your finger because in the, on the guitar, a lot of it is fingering. Um, blah, blah, blah. Get your tone together. Get to know your guitar, your amp, or in my case, my guitars and my amps. But I didn't really have the money to get too much stuff back then. So, you know, I, I, I stuck with a certain formula, like my 355 and, and a Fender, you know. Um, and so what I would do is I'd change my settings between practically every song, which I don't really do so much now. But I mean, I was really tuned in to what tones I wanted to get, what level and so on. So, uh, and that's a big job. I don't think a lot of people quite realize how much a part of what you do that is. You know, get to know your tone, get to know your equipment and just play for hours and hours and hours. That's all I did. That's all I did. <laughs> well, that is great. Like just a great story. Thank you. I, I personally feel like I play for hours and hours outside of school and then it feels like, am I really doing something? And on the topic of that, how did you balance music and school? Because like a life and work sort of thing because I know that you started being in a band during your school time and I personally had some cool, yeah. well, you know I mean I'm really smart so that helps a lot and I have good retention right so and I and I, I know that in part because one of my best moments in high school again I was very shy I didn't really talk to too many people but at homeroom one time one of our teachers gave us something to read. Maybe it was two or three pages and she handed it to all of us. And then she said, I'm giving you like, I forget what it was, two or three minutes, five minutes to read. And then uh, you need to answer this que the, a set of questions about how much you read and what you remember. And at the end of the class, she was kind of quiet and she looked up at me and she said, you know, you read the fastest and you remembered the most. Well, for me, that was a, such a big moment because I was getting sort of like, you know, the approval of somebody, you know, and that was such a big deal. So I applied that type of thinking or that type of practicing to, to everything that I did. So I did my homework. I, you know, I pretty much kind of did my homework during class or between classes. <laughs> and, uh, some hard subjects for me were like uh, geometry and algebra, but I had good teachers whom I could uh, ask questions of. And also my dad was an incredible math guy, incredible. So I could ask him questions. So I applied myself to doing my work, my homework. It wasn't really that hard, really for me. And then the rest of the time I applied myself to hearing and figuring out what was going on in music that was useful to us as a band. So like I would learn maybe, do you believe in magic? I was the one who sat with the 45 upstairs and figured it out and then taught it to everyone else. I don't think Jean was doing that as much. Maybe she sat with me, you know, but I feel like I applied myself equally when I was in high school. Now, when I got to college, I went for a year to UC Davis. And that's where I took a few music classes and that's where I learned keys and, you know, the relative minors and, uh, and actually I took a piano class and my piano teacher said to me, you know, you could be an incredible pianist if you wanted to, you know, cause I hadn't played piano since I was eight. 
I haven't really paid attention, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to put in that kind of time. So I was making choices as to where to put my time. What I wanted to find out starting in college, and remember, no lead guitar playing yet. I wanted to figure out how, you know, in a sort of utilitarian way, how do you put together a band? How do you play together? How do you uh, stay at the same tempo? How do you figure out what to play? And how, and how I did that was with the hit records. So, but the, that theory class really helped a lot. And we had to compose a few things, you know, that was easy for me because I just kind of hear it. Uh, by the way, I'm deaf in one ear and I don't have equilibrium on that side either. And I, I didn't know I was deaf in my left ear till uh, I was 13 when we moved to Sacramento and we had the hearing tests. <laughs> in fact, uh, the first year I was uh, here was junior high. So that's when I found out I was deaf in my left ear. And I told my mom that later that day, because the, the guy who did the hearing test was really agitated. And he said, did you, did you know you're deaf in my le your left ear? And I said, no, I mean, it didn't really matter to me because I had already, my brain had already figured out how to make stuff work, except I would get nauseated a lot, you know, in cars and whatever. But, um, so I went home and told my mom and she just, she didn't even really react. She just, you know, that Filipino way, <laughs> just kind of shrugged, well, what are you going to do? There was nothing to say. Even though we didn't make a big deal of it. It was just like, oh, you're deaf in your left ear? Nothing, nothing to do, you know, so... I have a different way of hearing, I feel, and a different way of integrating in my brain. And it's, uh, you know, it's specific to me. You know, so um, I hear a lot of stuff. I hear a lot of stuff, and I feel like it's coming through that side, you know, my left side. But I also feel like I was destined to be born with these, let's say, challenges, because actually I have a an impairment, let's say, but I don't see it that way. I see it as, you know, I see it as a plus because I hear a lot of stuff. So what I had to do was figure out the form. What are the rules? What is the form? How do you get the tone? How can you write songs, blah, blah, blah. And I just did that slowly but surely. I applied myself. And again, knowing how to apply myself was really important. You know, like I was never afraid of working for what I wanted. You know, and I was like, ah, this is too hard or whatever. I can't figure it out. If I couldn't figure it out, I just left it alone. You know, like, for example, the song, What's It All About, Alfie? That's an incredible song, but it's a piano song. So I did the best I could, and then I left it, you know. And uh, now I kind of poke around at it. It's, it's such an incredible composition, you know. So these are the kind of things that are in my work world that I super enjoy. I never get tired of music. I never get tired of learning something new, you know, because it's it, music is endless and it is our, it's our legacy. It's all of our legacy. I'm just uh, lucky to be able to just take a peek under the cover for especially uh, pop music, you know. I'm not even going to say rock because we weren't, we didn't do straight rock and roll when we got to L.A. We were we were more or less a pop slash funk band, you know, and I still love that stuff. I, I, I just love it. Rock and roll is more like, okay, I had to learn it. It's not, <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoy it when I'm doing it, but it's not like it's something I had to do, you know. And so I was just lucky that the friends that I made, like Lowell George, who was in the band Little Feet, he came over to Fanny Hill uh, one day and he says, you just absolutely have to learn this music, June. Because I didn't know about the, really, I didn't know about the blues. I didn't hear it in the, you know, we didn't know about blues in the Philippines. So he brought over Howlin' Wolf and uh, who was the other one? Anyway, two uh, blues greats. We listened to those records and I set upon learning what I could of the blues. It wasn't in my, really in my soul, but I, I can do the blues. I, you know, I learned it. So... And blues is in everything. So, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is how I put it together. It came at me in different in different ways. Number one was hearing it in ourselves and recognizing this is what we got to do. Number two, I started to write songs pretty much when we hit uh, the shores of the U.S. and so Sacramento. I started writing songs right away on my guitar, and we got recognized when we played our first, um, what do you call that, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Show, a show, you know, in junior high, talent show. So, uh, and I'd written a song called Miss Wall Wallflower 62. 
and uh, people really liked it. And I'm like, oh my God, they saw me in the hall and said, I really like that song. And then they move on, but we got attention. And so, whoa, that's a huge plus. So I just, you know, kept writing. Um, and that comes pretty easily to me, actually. Um, how has your Filipino culture impacted you as a person and also your music? Well, you know, as a Filipina, I feel like Filipinos are just so musical. So I almost took that as a given, but I can really see that now. As a culture, we're incredibly musical. Um, we can pretty much go on. I don't know where it comes from, but it just is, you know. So that's number one. Um, uh, I have to say that being part half Filipina has really impacted my life. And I have learned uh, music of this culture of the US as an outsider. I always felt like an outsider. So that was part of my keeping to myself and being so wary. And I think it really, uh, it not only affected me, but I, I feel like it was good for me in a lot of ways because I, I avoided a lot of pitfalls. And by that, I mean, I could concentrate on music pretty much one another. I wasn't so distracted by a lot of things that people get the drama of life, you know, because I was an outsider and I felt like I, I'm just going to ignore all this other stuff. <laughs> of course, it showed up later. I mean, I'm 72. The stuff started to show up around 30. I had to start working through stuff, but I successfully um, kind of um, uh, involve myself in life and I would say I came, I'm someone who came from behind because I'm always working on the thing, whatever the thing is, I apply myself, you know? So I'm one of those people that say you have to do something a million times in order to learn it or whatever that saying was. Yeah, I was that person. I kept doing it. I pulled up from behind and pretty much I was kind of getting ahead of people and pretty much I've stayed there because I apply myself. So. I, I feel like culturally, it's been a real plus. Um, it's been hard to feel like an outsider. That's one of my buttons, to feel invisible. And Anne always says, you are the least invisible people in the world, in the world, you know, but I, uh, internally, that's my button. I feel invisible. Um, and I, I, I think that is a Asian American thing, you know, or Asian thing. Um, uh, to be judged sort of on a different standard. We, you know, we're sort of the invisible populace, you know. If you're a black person, you know that your people were slaves. You know about the history of oppression. You know that you're being oppressed right now, okay? And in terms of Philippine Americans or Asian Americans, it's not really, we don't have anything to point to. We don't have our heroes who were martyred. We don't have that kind of, oh, you see that person, you know, Jose Rizal, who knows who Jose Rizal is, or Aguinaldo, you know, it's like, it's not, it's invisible, it's not seen, it's not even seen as important, so that's the kind of stuff that I know, but I can't really, you know, there's no point in talking about it, because no one's going to listen, so I just do what I need to do to make myself seen, I guess you could say, and that is, that just simply involves a lot of hard work. And that's why I always tell people, you know, sort of don't don't worry about you failed that one day. <laughs> you know, you played and it didn't work. You know, don't worry about that because there'll be another day when you'll play and it will work. And in fact, it could be the same exact set. You know, I noticed that in Fanny. We were very well rehearsed. We had the back end. We had this, that, and the other. We had roadies. We had amps. We had everything. And then we would maybe play one night and wherever and... It was incredible, like sparks flying. Blah, blah, blah. I played two days later and it fall flat. Now, what's the reason for that? Who knows? But there's no point in really staying too long on, on your failures, as well as there is no point in believing uh, kind of your own mystique, the own, your own kind of, uh, you know, what people throw at you as attributes. Um, they're, they're very seductive. And uh, sure, we all fall, fall for it, but they're not, um, it's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. It's part of the game. I mean, it's all a game. 
is part of the game and it's an important part. But if you believe in your own, you know, sort of promo too much, uh, you can get in serious trouble. So uh, I am a Buddhist, so I talk about the middle path, you know. So the middle path is to me the way don't believe in your failures uh, appreciate your successes and just keep going because every day is a different different situation the light falls on you slightly differently somebody believes this thing about you somebody believes that thing about you well don't get caught up in that it's just not worth it it's not worth it so developing a good inner strength i think and sleeping enough eating the right food you know that's actually very important that's my advice to you <laughs> um what would you say is your best quality about being a leader well um one of my best qualities is i go really deeply into every decision i make it's not a, it's not really thrown out like Oh, we should do this or you know whatever my uh, advice or my orders are i do think deeply about everything and as i've grown older i've been able to listen to others around me so you know for feedback so when i was in the svelts i was sort of a natural leader because i i did put forth the effort for example to book gigs when we didn't have a booking agent i uh, learn the songs, blah, blah, blah. And I insisted that we <laughs> rehearse really a lot. Thank goodness Jean was all for that because it gave us a life, you know. Um, um, and as I, as I am now on the other side of 50, let's say, so again, I'm 72, I, I noticed that people who resented me for being a leader, for making the decisions, the sort of making them do, bend to my will maybe understand uh understand what i was about a little bit better because i i mean i got a lot of pushback from whomever you know but um in terms of teaching at ima i feel like ima and, and working with the rock and roll girls camps have taught me so much you cannot push teenage girls around i mean you probably know that you cannot push teenage girls around so you have to find a way to seduce them into loving what it is that they already love but they don't know how to contain it they don't know how to think about it let's say uh you want to write songs but you're afraid to write songs or you want to move but you don't know how to move you want to please the audience but you don't know how to look at them for example, these are very simple, practical uh, situations that we have to deal with as performers, as artists, you know, how do we, and also how do we look at ourselves as viewed through other people's eyes? And this is, a, these are very practical questions. So I've learned so much about how you can impart that, you know, how do you get a girl to move? Because actually they should be afraid they're becoming teenagers and their and their world's changing and there's a lot of stuff coming at them so i don't blame them for being afraid you know but to enjoy themselves that's a different thing and so i have to seduce them into enjoying themselves and when i say seduce i have to find a way to cause them to fall in love with themselves so that they forget that they were afraid three minutes ago I'm really terrified three minutes ago. You know, they couldn't look into someone's eyes three minutes ago, you know. How do you do that? Well, there are ways. So, you know, so I feel like Aime has taught me so much. And I, I guess part of being a leader is to really think deeply about everything. I, I feel, for me, that, that has been. I never, I never just like, oh, we should do this because, you know, I have the power, I feel like whatever. I feel like I've always thought about decisions uh, very deeply and, and um, considered, you know, considered um, what I'm asking for, you know. So, uh, uh, phone, phone, phone. Hold on one second. And this is on the phone a really great songwriter herself. <laughs> Diana Jones. Look her up sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. 
Um, so you mentioned how a lot of your students have been having self-worth problems and being afraid of how people will perceive them. Have you ever struggled with self-worth and how have you overcome that? I mean, I think I've always struggled with self-worth. That's, that's always been one of, let's, let's say it's one of our issues. Everybody struggles with it, you know. So, um, number one, I would avoid the issue when I was younger and just work harder. And that produced really good results. I'm not say that I'm not saying that's good for personal growth. So if you can find people to whom to talk with and, uh, and, you know, I mean, number one, don't worry too much about what people are thinking. Do your thing and do it well. In fact, do it so well that you can't be faulted for it. That's number one. That's really good armor without worrying about anybody else, you know, because you spend so much time with that. So actually that's kind of an exercise in futility because there are always be people who are judging you, always be people who are looking at you. There'll always be commercials that say you should own this car, wear this dress, wear this makeup and so on. So we have to figure out a way in which we, all of us, uh, and, and including us when we're 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on, to not believe all of that. You know, so self-worth, I think, is, is finding a way to give yourself what you need without relying on other people to give it to you. And that can be done. That can be done if you just pause long enough to say to yourself, you know, all these people who seem so important now, you won't even know them in 30 years, maybe 20 years, maybe t you won't even know them. So why, you know, let's ask the question, why is it, is what they say and think of you so important? Actually, it is not. But in the moment, it is. So there you have the contradiction, okay? I think one has to recognize that there is a contradiction. You know, that really, I mean, at my age, I'm giving it to myself, and I know that. I finally have broken through enough to say to myself, you know what, I'm going to give it to myself. I'm going to stop listening to people who say whatever they say about me that's, you know, it's kind of... It's unpalatable. It's not, you know, it's not good for you. So if it's poison for you, just, you know, don't even, don't even. Because it's not important. I'm not even going to say it's not that important. It's not important. So, you know, if you can develop your radar uh, enough so that you find people who, who are, you know, in a, let's say in a way healthy for you. And of course, there are all these relationships and they're always changing. Okay. So we know that and we accept that. Really, you got to give it to yourself and not believe in everybody else. That's that is the point in which you get in real trouble. You know, who you know, the spiritual spiritual question is, who am I now? There's a lot more than one would think in who am I? But it helps to peel away the layers. I mean, who am I really? And why are these people, what, why are their thought forms so important? The answer is, they're not. So that's, that's one really important aspect of uh, dealing with the insincerity of being alive. Most people are insincere, or they think they're being insincere, but they've got their own hungry ghosts to feed. I hope that answers your question. It definitely does. That, personally, for me, that's something I really need to take into consideration. I'd also like oh, to... Believe, believe me. Believe it. I mean, yes, yes. Yeah. Just believe everything. <laughs> just... <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, to go on top of that, how do you deal with comparison? Because I know that that's something that goes hand in hand with self-worth. And yeah. I kind of feel it's in the rubric of everything I just said. You know, how do you deal with comparison? Don't deal with it. I mean, stuff that seems so important right now, people who seem so important, they're going to fade away. So you have to keep finding that place in yourself that is your own self-worth, that rises above comparison. 
You know, I mean, can everybody play like you? I doubt it, right? So give that to yourself, you know? Give it to yourself, enjoy it to the max, and spread it. You know, don't listen to everybody. I mean, I know that's really a hard uh, position to take, but all of us basically are just seething thought forms. Seething. A lot of thought arises without volition, without her even saying, I want to think that. It just arises. So what are you going to believe in? That's where I and leaders and whatnot have to step back and be silent and consider what is really being said. What is the comparison? And you know what? Even if they have a point now, they won't maybe in a year if I just keep working harder Look, you're a beautiful young woman, okay? I can say that because I see you. Now, I don't know what people say about you, and I don't care. You know what I'm saying? I know what I see. So if I say, if I met someone who said, you know, the Althea, she's blah, 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 I'd be thinking, wait a minute, are we talking about the same person? You know, because people have their, uh, you know, people want to beat each other out. They do. So... Why should you pay attention to that? That is a common energy. That's common. So why don't we reach for what's a little bit more altruistic, that has a more of a peaceful quality? Uh, uh, why don't we develop qualities that can help me and each other, for example? So you have to screen a lot of stuff, you know? I don't take comparison at, at, at face value. It's fake. <laughs> It was like fake news. Wait, you just said that about me? You must be talking about somebody else because I know that's not who I am, right? So like that. I mean, I, I don't know how to say it any better. There's a lot of stuff you just have to ignore or you have to consider and work out and don't believe that everyone in your life now is so important because they're not, because they're not. I mean, I think about, I wonder what happened to you know, these two guys who were, we were such great friends within high school and we were in bands together. We palled around together for about a year or two. Where are they? I don't even know. Are they alive? I don't know. I can think about the things that we did together and they were never really mean to us. I remember the, we, the mean ones, but they didn't really matter in the long run. They didn't have anything to do with my life's arc. So you have an arc. And you have a responsibility to that. So keep it clean in every way that you can. You know, you don't need to be mean to, me, to people. Just don't believe them or consider, are they right? You know, it's, it's in you. It's in you is what I'm saying. And that is beautifully said. Um, <laughs> just to go on top of that as well, how do you think, how important do you think is women supporting women and how much of an impact has it made on your life? Oh, it's had, had a total impact on me. You know, I can divide my life into three or four phases, okay? One is through Fanny and just beyond. So I quit Fanny in 73, October 73, and I was a complete wreck. I mean, my mother thought I was going to die because I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. You know, it wasn't like I was doing too much drugs. I was in grief because I realized that where I was was something I, A, couldn't handle, and B, I wanted to learn how to be a person I knew. I didn't have the slightest idea of how to get that information. I was completely terrified, you know. I had to leave because I was uh, just... I just knew I had to go. So, and that was hard. You know, I had to leave Jean. Uh, I had to leave everything we'd been building for towards since 1964, 65. You know, that was really hard. And I ended up in Woodstock, New York, um, partly because of Elliot, who we lived in the years. Um, he didn't live there, but he, he turned me on to a gig. And I ended up there, and that was the best thing that could have happened to me because it was very quiet. I was away from the hustle bustle um, and I started to write songs like Heaven is in Your Mind, Your Own Way, which are songs I still 
perform now. And I started to read Shunyo Suzuki's Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And so I started to bow to the trees. I started to develop compassion. I started to figure out that there actually is a way to deal with what is coming at you. Life, you know, to, to sort of sort through what's, you know, let's say important or not important or hurtful and not hurtful. I started to realize that, yes, that there are contradictions and you can't solve every contradiction. So there are ways, at least in the Buddhist path, where if you are following the middle way, you don't have to think about it. You are in the middle way. You don't have to think this is good, this is bad, whatever. Middle way is separate from all of that. So I started to learn that. Um, then the second phase was a couple of years after that I was living in Woodstock and the woman I was living with got a tape from someone, a cassette tape. And I was doing stuff around the house and I heard this music and I heard this voice and I heard the reaction. I'm like, after it finished, I said to her, who was that? You know, cause I mean, it was really palpable. It was big. <laughs> it was in a church basement and it was Chris Williamson and it was the beginning of women's music. Okay, that's how I got involved with Chris and women's music. Because Chris said to her, hey, I'm doing an album. You want to play bass? Yeah. And so I got drawn into women's music slash feminism. And I had already started with, you know, investigating Buddhist studies. I was still really confused about everything. But I got dragged into feminism. And there starts this whole saga that, that is everything that you can imagine you know there's anger there's fights there's feminist thought there's um, big women's music audiences and i was playing with the goddess of women's music nobody really knew who i was you know so then i had to and i and i realized oh i really like this because she's taking all the heat she's taking all the attention i don't have to worry about that so it was like a little vacation for me while i was being swept into the apex to me of these turbulent times so women's music women's music blah 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 then ima i got together with Anna a couple of years after that in 86 we started ima so then starts the other uh big portion of my life so in each of these uh let's say episodes three big episodes actually four because philippines is one sacramento spelt Fanny is two, three is women's music slash feminism, four is IMA and everything else that that has brought and is bringing. Um, so it, it kind of gets all mixed up, but, but in the midst of this, I am learning, learning, learning. And I remember specifically one of the women who, one of the women who formed Olivia Records. Do you, do you know about this whole thing? Olivia Records, oh, you should. You should. Very important. You should check this whole out. Women's music movement. Olivia Records with it was sort of the, um, maybe a year after I met her. I remember I went to uh, you know to go have a sauna with three or four women, and as we were leaving, uh, this woman who's just written a book, um, I'm, I'm about to read it, said, "You have a sense of humor." She said, "I actually heard you laugh." You know, I didn't know that. Nobody thought, people thought I was unapproachable. People think I didn't, thought I didn't laugh. I had no sense of humor. And it was Chris who said to me, you know, you're really funny. And Chris is one of the funniest people I know. She and Bonnie Raitt are the two funniest people I know. They're naturally witty. They're, they can, somebody can say something and their mind bounces off it and they have a retort that's just, you're doubled over, you know? She said, you know, you're really funny. I'm like, what? I didn't know I was funny. I didn't know I could make her laugh, you know, because she was just like, I was just in awe of her connection with her, her audience and how she could make them laugh. A lot of times I'd be on stage with her, I didn't, couldn't even hear what she said because, first of all, there are no monitors usually. Monitors really weren't even invented yet. So I couldn't hear what she said, but I heard the laughter from the crowd. And I was just like, how do you do that, right? So... That was a phase in my life in which I was learning certain things about myself. And I was really introduced, uh, interested in producing records. So I started to go after production. So I, I produced a number of really well-known women's music albums. 
and I learned from that, but I was still kind of, you know, uh, pretty stiff, except when I was with Chris. But I feel like one of my jobs in life uh, is, and has been, to put people together. So, for example, Chris wanted to meet Bonnie, and I put that together, and Bonnie played on one of the albums that I produced, so Chris is, you know, like that. So I feel like I have been helpful in quiet ways to people, not so much um, public like now when people are saying to me, you know, the music that you have done or what you, are, the music you are doing or the way that you are is really helping me because uh, you're a role model, let's say. You know, and I like that. I like that kind of feedback, but I did not get that when I was younger. I did not get that when I was younger. I was pretty tough. I was a tough cookie, you know. I didn't know how to not be tough because I had to punch my way into the world or let's say through the world, whatever the words are, right? I had to punch my way in and the only way to do that was to be tough and basically not listen to people who said, you know, you shouldn't do this, you can't do it, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I did hear it, but it didn't stop me, you know. So I had to be tough. I had to be forward moving, forward thinking. I had to be like a battering ram. You know, because we played point for all the women who came after us. Believe me, I didn't want to play lead guitar because that is an exposed position. I got a lot of heat. Either uh, some guy would say it, you know, like, let you know, let's jam. I, I want to see how good you are. Are you kidding? No. You know, th that was really common. Um, so uh, now I don't even care if somebody says that. If somebody even intimates that, I'm, I'm out of the room, I'm out of the conversation. It's like, it's this is not anything I'm interested in hearing. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> but, um, you know, there have been so many phases in my life where I've learned different things. And now I'm at a point where I can talk about it and I don't feel my anger rise, I don't feel my reactions. I don't have them anymore because I've determined that they are not worth listening to. You know, I have to be genuine in the moment. And that is really actually the only thing that works. It's that is clean. That's the cleanest way to be. So you adjust your own motivation. You clean your own space and everything goes from there. And I don't care what somebody thinks I'm doing. How do they know what I'm doing? They don't actually. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> What would you say is your greatest achievement in your like life so far? Not only musically, but also just on your personal side. Well, I've been able to um, maintain a relationship with Anne for like 36 years. And that's a big achievement. Yeah. We've had to go through uh, a big journey together. That includes founding IMA a couple of years after we got together. And we're, we, we, we are and we have learned together. The whole thing about keeping your personal space clean is something that we realize is so important and we do it together. You know, it has to do with our relations with other people as well. We don't lie. We don't steal. You know, I mean, it's easy to fall for those traps. You begin to have a little bit of power and you start, you know, maybe I could take a shortcut or whatever. I mean, that's not worth it at all. Fortunately, I had really good teachers, and you know those would include the Dalai Lama, Lama Gonpa, Ruth Dennison. I've had really massive, massively great teachers. So I've learned so much from them, and I feel like that is a huge. In fact, I was thinking about that earlier today. The fact that Ann and I have maintained our relationship and are still have all the genuine uh, attributes of love, being in love, affection, learning together being honest with ourselves and each other, you know, that's really important. Um, another is that um, I've had relationships with my nephews and nieces that are really great. Like my nephew Lee, who's here right now, who's Jean's son. I have a really good relationship with him. You should watch the uh, live streams, by the way, Thursdays at 6 o'clock. <laughs> okay. So... 
basically he grew up with us. I mean, he's never not known Auntie Anne because she and I got together in 84 and he was born, uh, October 84, he was born in March 85. So he's never not known Auntie June with Auntie Anne, which is kind of cool, you know? And a lot of my, a lot of my nephews, you know, uh, and nieces um, have that relationship with us. They kind of, in a way, grew up with us. I mean, we're still growing up. I feel like I'm still growing up, you know? So I feel really great about that, to be able to have conversations. And maybe 20 years ago, I said, you know, have you read the book Meetings with Remarkable Men? It's a book by Gurdjieff. No, Auntie Juna, <laughs> yes, I gave to him, you know, whether he read it or not, it was there. You know, stuff like that I'm able to pass on, which I feel is, um, what would be the word? It's, it, it, it's really useful. It's really useful. So I've been able to pass on useful things to my, you know, all my relations, so, you know, to everyone around me, but especially uh, those closest to me. Um, IMA is a huge, IMA is huge. IMA is huge. Uh, the fact that we've kept it together and uh, the what I've learned through being a co-head of a nonprofit is how to ask ask for help you want to know what the secret to it it is I didn't know I didn't know this at first not to be attached to the answer you see because everything in life changes so so often somebody would say to me, let's say somebody in a corporation, no, we, we can't give you that right now because we're not in a place too good. They try us in a couple of years, and I would try in a couple of years, and many times the answer was different, you know? So that's uh, material help. But there's also, you know, the help of somebody like Monty Raid, who I'm, I've known since Fanny, and I asked her to... I told, we told her about our idea and I asked her to write something and she did right there on the spot. So I asked for that. I didn't know if she would say, I mean, I was pretty sure she'd say yes, but you know, so to learn how to ask without being attached to the answer and also not being angry because somebody didn't get, give you the answer you wanted. So that has to do with the middle way. I keep learning the middle way over and over again. Things change. You know, so someone may give you something right away. That's great, but we've so many times passed the hat and at IMA West in California. We didn't have uh, uh, we didn't have money to buy firewood, so we would go to the ocean and get wood that we could burn in our fireplace in the winter. You know, stuff like that. You learn the value of being humble and not resenting it or anything. You just are where you are. You know, and let's put it this way. There's a 50-50 chance always that it'll get better. 50-50. And you can increase the odds by cleaning up your own space, by having a humbleness, a, a sort of a, I, I, I would call it almost a warrioress, warrior type bravery of receiving an answer that you don't really want right then or you know a situation you don't really feel like you want to deal with you know whatever but there you are so part of bravery is accepting the way things are you know and that they always change and that's one of my uh, the big lessons from my teacher Ruth Dennison she was pretty hard on me so let's say we were riding someplace you know other people in the car and all of a sudden she'd say June do you see that those are clouds up there and not your idea of a cloud? Wham! Okay? You may not even know what that means, but think about that. Because in every moment in life, before we react, there's pure phenomena. A split second of pure phenomena. You walk out in your, your yard, you, there's the sun, but all of a sudden you're making a judgment about the day, making a judgment about what's in front of you. There was a split second before any of that happens. Do you see that those are clouds and not your idea of clouds? I mean, what a teacher she was for me. So, you know, she helped us. You know, the lessons that we can learn from life are never ending. Never ending. 
You think you might have learned something, and then wham, you get slapped across the face by it. I thought I learned that a long time ago. Wow, it's back. <laughs> so again and again, the wheel is the wheel of life. So I feel, uh, I feel so fortunate to have had such great teachers, you know, and to have realized, yes, life really does change. And don't try to hold on to it, you know? I mean, I never, never would have imagined in a million years that anyone would have watched Ace Epicular. Never. Never. <laughs> that was never in my sphere of thinking that people would even talk about me or talk about us or talk about our accomplishments. So this is kind of good of a good time for me, although I still I still hate to see those comments about Fanny, you know, you shouldn't call yourself that. Maybe blah, 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 blah. Or why do you keep talking about feminism or talking about how you were the only girls? Are you kidding? You're a guy, you're coming from an elitist culture. You have no idea what it's like to feel like you're by yourself. No idea. So shut up. I don't say shut up. I have other... <laughs> Like, I'll just say, you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> you know. So that's still coming at me, but I have so much positive coming at me that I, I, I just had, simply had to live this long, see. I had to survive. And there really is something to that. Keep living, keep learning, everything changes, you change, your needs change, you know. How much you need to be fed by the outside world could definitely change. You could give it to yourself. <laughs> so, you know, it's good. Um, I'm, I, I'm I, sorry. <laughs> yes, that's great. Um, I just also like to ask at the moment, what is your favorite album? You know, I pretty much stay with the oldies, the goodies, you know, like, uh, uh, the first, uh, um, uh, God, what was the name of that band? Well, I'll go with the Beatles, let's say, the Beatles. How can you beat that? I mean, I don't know, right? I, I don't have a favorite current album because I don't, I think so much of it is basically just kind of drivel, and it's just like, you know, hook after hook that don't really mean anything. What's your favorite album? I'd love to know that. Um, I've been a list, I listen to quite a big range. Um, I think there are certain mainstream albums that do have um, a spark. I'm personally like a fan of Taylor Swift and her latest Evermore album, Very Lyrically, is charged. Um, let's see, I haven't, there's this um, indie rock album called The Baby by Samia, which is really good. I've been, I've just been trying to get out of my little sphere. And yeah, I don't know if that? it is. So, um, what is that? Samia's The Baby as well. How do you spell it? How do you spell her name? Is that a her? Uh, yes, S-A-M-I-A. -A. Oh, listen to that. Yeah, she's well, the Billie daughter. Eilish, people have turned us on to Billie Eilish. Yeah. You know, she's great. Um, the girls at camps love her, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, they really do. Um, and there's this guy, what's his name? Josh Collins or something like that from England. Um, a lot of people listen to him. I, you know, I, I mean, I know he's really, really good, but it just doesn't touch me. Something has to really reach inside uh, and move me. So there's a lot of people who I think are really good, but they're not moving my soul. Um, I don't know if that has to do with age or just that I've been listening to music for so long. <laughs> you know, there's a woman from Mali, and I can't think of her name right now, but she's uh, incredible. I'll, I'll send you a link to one of her things. Incredible. So um, there's just so much, you know, I love Brazilian music, for example, and not a lot of people actually listen to it except for go from Ipanema, you know, like that. And so much beautiful stuff and, and uh, the rhythm that comes out of Brazil and Africa. I, I'm very big on rhythm and uh, I cherish people who play rhythm well, you know, uh, themselves or on other people's records. That's a big thing for me, rhythm. So... 
Yeah, I think I I can definitely relate this. I used to like never listen to mainstream because I just felt it didn't connect. But I definitely think there are certain ones like Harry Styles. He's a great rock artist in a, in his new music. Just suggestions. <laughs> um, well, send me links. Send me links. I, I I would love to listen. Okay, that would be great. Please do. Please do. Yeah, that'd be um, super. For my last question, I would like to ask. Um, what advice would you give to young girls growing up and also just in music in general? Well, to young girls, I mean, one of my biggest pieces of advice would be to find each other in however ways you can. And and form, you know, it's not just relationships. It's it's like forming a bond. It's, it's uh, almost physical that you can help each other and protect each other. Don't put each other down, you know. Help each other through your hard parts, collabor collaborate if you can. If you can't, just kind of be around each other, you know. I think that's really important. Um, a girl sitting alone in her room, wishing and hoping for whatever is not, it's probably not gonna yield the results that this person wants. So I think to create a force, which in, in some ways I think is happening, right? Um, and, you know, basically, I, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but don't stop. Don't stop and stop listening to other people because, you know, there's a way in which pe people put each other down and some of it's like really subtle and I I'm pretty um, attuned to the, the many ways in which people do it. So just try to be aware, do your thing, be dedicated to it and do the work. And um, it may take a long time before there are results, but you, you know, if you have to do it, do it. There are some of us for whom we have to do it. We have to do it. So it would be the same for a girl who wants to play soccer or, you know, whatever, be the best, you know. So we have to hone in on what it is that we want to do, what we, it is we have to give up, maybe in part, to achieve that. And don't stop. Uh, join forces. Join forces. Really. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. So welcome. You're so welcome. So we'll keep in touch. We'll send each other links and so 